kind of lost faith on in generation on generation progress, which we got really used to post war, post Second mm. World War, that actually is going to get better, not the same or worse for each generation of young people. And that has all sorts of knock on effects too for everyone, not just for the young people themselves. It kind of puts a bit of strain on our faith in the system overall. Hi everyone, before we start, I want to take a minute to talk about my next book. You may have heard about the story of GameStop in January or February and thought it was all over. You're sadly mistaken. Unfolding Online has been a clash between the corrupt practices of Wall Street and the hive mind of the internet. It's a hot, raging information war pitting retail investors against financial giants swimming in corruption and fraud. The trailer is at the end of this podcast, but if you want to help crowdfund the book or just find out more, you can sign up to my mailing list to get access to a preview of chapter one or go to whenmoon.com to read more about the book. The first 200 people to pre-order the book will get a free pack of To The Moon crayons with their book. I just want to make a quick mention of our sponsors. Namecheap are one of the cheapest places on the internet to get a domain name for your next website. I've used Namecheap for all the sites I've ever purchased and I find it really easy to use. Spreaker are a rapidly growing platform for podcast recording, publishing and monetization with pricing plans as low as $7 per month. A cheap way to host your podcast and start earning from your back catalogue of shows. Finally, ExpressVPN is the internet's most trusted VPN. Protect your privacy and watch and view content that is location locked. You can even try watching Netflix from a different country. And right now, they're offering 35% off 12 months of ExpressVPN. Please use the links in the description below if you want to support the show. Anyway, here's the podcast. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today, I am here with Professor Bobby Duffy, Professor of Public Policy and Director of the Policy Institute at King's College London, Chair of the Campaign for Social social science and author of the brand new book generations how and why we change uh bobby welcome to the show oh, great to be here thank you no problem so yeah i was really intrigued um when i saw your book a few weeks ago uh generations because i've been thinking quite a lot about the differences between um people who are millennial age and younger and um yeah the older generations. So to start off, what do you think the biggest division is between um, yeah, millennials and Zoomers and uh, the older Gen Xers and beyond? It's a, yeah, it's a really good question because I think, I mean, a lot of the book is separating generational myths from realities because there's a, there's a lot of nonsense and stereotypes about generational difference. And maybe we'll come on to, I'm sure, some of the the stereotypes, but there are real differences as well. And that's why taking a generational perspective, I think is really useful. You need to understand what is truly different in the experience and attitudes, behaviors of um, generations. If you want to understand where we are now and what the future looks like, because you know, generations are a key element of how societies change. And I was thinking about your question, because it is, <clears throat> is a good one. And I think the, the main thing that is different is more about the context than, than particularly the economic context um, between between that kind of millennial and then younger group and then um, parts of Gen X and then up to baby boomers <clears throat> because the economic context has just changed hugely um, for them, uh, not just with the economic crash in 2008, but in the run to that wages were already stagnating, um, uh, house prices had gone, had, you know, had decades of, uh, of continual increases, really uh, massively increased that, that lock lots of uh, younger generations out, which was one of the big explanations of why wealth has become so much more skewed towards older people, which is a new thing um, for us, that income, wealth, home ownership, all of those types of things. Is, uh, younger generations are on a very different path on lots of those things to people that were born just a few years earlier or a couple of decades earlier. So, and that has lots and lots of knock on effects on how younger generations live, because it does mean they live longer at home. 
than previous generations. It means they are less likely to own their own home. And it's tied up with a kind of general delayed adulthood <clears throat> approach, which is, is driven by you know longer time in education uh, and changing social norms about when you get married and have kids, all those types of things. But it's had all sorts of knock-on effects, um, uh, in, including on inequality between um, generations. And then uh, and one of the, the key themes of the book is inequality is actually becoming more intergenerational, um, as in life chances being passed down um, in between family, within families now, because of this concentration of wealth among this older group. Um, so lots and lots of, uh, lots and lots of myths, but some really, really important realities that have shaped lives differently for younger generations compared to old. And I think, I mean, just finally on that, one of the things that is really important in that is that we've kind of lost faith on in generation on generation progress, which we got really used to post-war, post-Second mm. World War, that actually is going to get better, not the same or worse for each generation of young people. And that has all sorts of knock-on effects too for everyone, not just for the young people themselves. It kind of puts a bit of strain on our faith in the system overall. Mm. Yeah. So you mentioned that you think that the biggest dividing line sort of between older and, and younger generations is this economic context. Do you think this affects the people sort of psychologically or, or more broadly on like a societal level? Like, do you think that is changing the way that this generation or the next generations think? Do you think that's like having an effect? And do you think that sort of shapes our, our worldview and ideology as a generation? Yes, I mean, it's it bound to. Um, one, one of the key tenets of um, generational thinking um, is that we are more malleable in our late teen, early adult years when you're forming <clears throat> your kind of world view. And then it kind of set, settles down more after that, um, after that type of period. So what's happening to you during those formative years um, does have a big, big effect. And that's shown, you know, repeated in, and is the basis of, you know, very big theories and um, concepts within uh, social science generally. So it's, um, <clears throat> yes, it's bound to have an, have an effect. I, I guess, I mean, the main, the thing about generations and why it's important to understand is that every new generation comes in with a different mindset or not configured to the current um, mindset. So we've got this sense that we've got, we've got this process of constant change through uh, generations. And so the fact that young people are different now um, from older generations is is not at all a surprise. In fact, it's like an essential part of society that you get people coming in um, with different perspectives because it kind of pushes us us forward. So there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. The problem becomes um, uh, when the when you lose that sense of uh, progress, um, and that is uh, that is one of the risks in this, particularly among young people. And you can kind of see. Uh, things that we haven't seen before um, in the UK context in particular, in in the way that uh, how we vote has become much more age driven. And it's like uh, in, in the in the book, I use these charts that just track generations over time, um, just plotting their kind of life, life in these lines, uh, in these chart lines. If you look at the Labour Party, for example, um, uh, generational profile for their vote it's just going back to the 1980s there was just never any age gap in it it sort of cut across age groups until you get to the last four or five years or five or six years and then it just explodes you've got this uh, incredible uh, age-based um, division in Labour's votes and an increasingly divided uh, age divided vote for the Conservatives too and that's very new and unusual for our politics and and it is it is important and it is <clears throat> um i think it's not a particularly um positive way to divide our uh, electorate in many ways because it's kind of builds in this this dynamic that you've seen a bit in the us as well where uh one side thinks they've got demography on their side because they've got this coming generation of, of young voters who are connected to them uh, wrongly mostly think it's like a demographic demography is not destiny mostly on 
on, on politics. And then the other side thinks thinks the same, and but then also thinks um, they need to pull their base closer to them, maximise their vote from the other, <clears throat> from older groups, which means they tend to emphasise the extremeness of the other side. Um, the, they are captured by social justice warriors and all of those types of things. So you've got this dynamic that gets quite divisive um, once you start to get an age base split in your vote. And I think that's one of the stories of the last few years and why we're seeing one of the reasons we see such a focus on culture change and concern about culture change in our politics, which it's, in itself is not very positive, um, tends not to end well, uh, as, as we see from culture wars in, in the US. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, people are always like, why are you so obsessed with what's happening in America? And I'm like, we're five years behind, like, um, which I, in almost yeah. everything, I find at least. That's a good point. Um, and you see that in generations. I mean, it's probably it's, more like 10 to 20 years behind on the generational patterns. It's uh, wages stagnate, started stagnating quite a bit before for younger people started stagnating quite a bit before. In, but you can, it is, that's how I think about it too as well, is that we have a choice of what, what path we, we can follow here. And um, we are in danger of following that US path, but we don't have to because we are earlier on. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's it, uh, hopefully we can we can sort of stop becoming some of the, the worst aspects of that. Um, so what do you think is is causing that? that generational divide. So you, you talked a lot about, about Jeremy Corbyn, for example, or well, not, not even Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour Party having a lot of support from young people, which seems to correlate almost exactly with the election of Jeremy Corbyn. I'd say he's at least a large factor in this, but obviously it's not a UK specific phenomenon. Like we've, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the book by David Goodhart, um, The Road to Somewhere, I think it's called, or is it yeah. The Road to Anywhere? The Road to Somewhere, I think it is. And he, he sort of points out that these differences that we're seeing in society are occurring across most of the developed world in a way, or at least Europe and America, he's, he sort of focuses on more specifically. So what do you think it is that's causing this divide between, say, that, that, that line where, where the, it crosses from Gen X to Millennial? Like, what, what do you think is the, is the, the reason that there's such well, a I think difference think, I think there? it's this dynamic about... Um, economic stagnation, um, giving a less clear sense of progress to, towards a better future than, than we've become used to. And then when that economic bit goes, uh, we tend to get more competitive with each other. It becomes more fractious about who's getting what exactly. If, if everything stops, if growth stops, and there's not an automatically better future for all of us, you get much more sensitive about who's getting what and um, more divisive about that and and then equally when the economic uh, axis if you like of um of uh, political progress is is let is more curtailed for political parties as in they can't paint a better political uh, economic future very easily for people then they they can tend to more focus on culture and um justice and equality and and those types of things and and that cultural divide is automatically will automatically separate young and old because of that point of younger generations always come in with um, uh, different views, different values from older generations. And you can kind of see that throughout um, the, well, the history that I can look back to in, in my kind of survey work, which is, you know, middle of the century, uh, 20th century. Um, and you can see these, these repeated waves of that. So it uh, it's kind of a dynamic that isn't, just specific to the UK, as you say, not specific at all, not specific to one individual or a particular character, although, you know, it's kind of predictable that you get those types of political figures coming out because of that dynamic, if you see what I mean. It's more it's more an effect than a cause of this bigger um, dynamic. Um, so, yeah, it's not at all surprising that you see it, that you see it elsewhere. I think we are one of the extremes on this um, in terms of how, when you look at political divisions and that focus. Um, when we did a big study on culture wars, uh, for example, um, and part of it was an international element to the study and then comparing the UK with um, the US, mostly in terms of theory and, and some of the evidence. 
And what you found was um, that we are we are quite mid Atlantic. Um, there's lots of people in Europe that are worried about that same sort of cultural thing, but they're sort of looking at where what direction we go in as a predictor of what may happen to them a bit further down the line. So we are a little bit in the vanguard of following that that sort of route. Um, and yeah, that's the worry. Yeah, this is slightly concerning. It's mm -hmm. um, real interesting to watch though, for there's there's definitely something like strange going on there with, with exactly how divided the country seems to be in terms of, yeah, older versus younger people. And I mean, my my assessment mm -hmm. of it. Now you can you can correct me if you think I'm I'm wrong here. But my assessment, at least, is that we are looking at the degradation of of like our system of of government democracy, and that the division is basically caused by the people who at least had benefit from the way that our system is set up clinging to the hope that that can be renewed and restored versus the people who have not, who have like been, as, I don't want to say victims of the system, but like they've not, they've not prospered in the way say previous generations had and that they are kind of rallying against what they see to be a completely corrupt and broken system. And they kind of trying to reject everything that surrounds that but being yeah, the uh, mainstream political figures, um, the way they believe the system should be set up, even the whole way down to like capitalism itself. But that's definitely a strong theme within a lot of analysis of this. Um, and you can see, you know, there's uh, work by Yasha Monk and there's a Cambridge University report that, that makes a lot of some of those points about um, how younger people are losing faith in democracy. And, um, and I, I looked at that data and I think it's overstated how much um, young people are actually rejecting. Yeah, younger current generations of young are actually rejecting the system. When I actually look at it, this is more looking back over 30, 40 years, um, back to the 1970s. And uh, when I look at it, what you actually see is mostly that young people come in with more trust, come into um, adulthood with more trust in politics and more trust in democracy and satisfaction with democracy that they slowly lose <laughs> through repeated disappointments of the actual experience of democracy um, rather than coming in as a new mm. um, a new generation that's rejecting this and the, the gap that some of that analysis talks about are really quite small when you zoom out a bit and you look at the long term because the second point that you notice from this long term view is that there isn't like a, a slow slide to inevitable decline in views of democracy. What there is, is it goes up and down quite a bit. And, um, you know, there have been periods in our history where people were much more negative about democratic system, political systems um, more generally, and then came back from it. I mean, the 1970s does stand out in lots of countries as that, but there's other, you know, in Germany, it was more around unification um, where, people, uh, where people were more under pressure. Um, so no, I, I think it's not as negative as that. Um, and I think, it, and that longer term view, generational view, it's really helpful to give you a bit of a sense of it's not all lost and we have some agency here and young people are not the drivers of, uh, you know, more extreme change that you might think. And and I think there's a couple of things just to say about that is, first of all, part of the reason it feels like that is because we've got a very different information environment now where the extremes are more accentuated and more visible to people. Um, and you kind of get that sense of a very fractious debate mm -hmm. from looking at social media when actually most young people are getting, trying to get on with their lives and not that uh, involved in um these types of things and then the second point is you've got to remember that um our connections up and down generations are much stronger than our connections across generations we may feel hard done by uh, we do uh, feel hard done by as individual generations but we're also very connected to our parents and grandparents and they're very connected to us so there isn't an awful lot of resentment or 
uh, real calls for action for intergenerational transfer of wealth or life chances. And there's, there's recognition that baby boomers were lucky and um, have got um, come out of this quite well uh, through uh, fortune uh, and political decisions. But there's not a big sense of actually, okay, so let's then take money off them um, and give it to young people, among young people themselves. In fact, young people mostly say give more to pensioners or, or old people. Um, and that's interesting. I mean, it's like there's a, there's a very clear rebalance towards older people in wealth and income and life chances generally around housing and everything else. Uh, but what people call for is more general improvements in better jobs, more generally better housing, more generally better public services, uh, rather than a, a redistribution. It's because, we, it's because of that love point, but it's also because... Um, we're going to get old. Age is a very strange uh, characteristic because we pass through the different groups in the way that you don't with social class or gender or ethnicity or other sorts of things. So you can kind of see your own future in how we treat older people today as well. So there's not there's not an awful lot of incentive to say, let's penalise or take back from older people because we're going to be there one day ourselves, hopefully. Um, uh, so there's lots of reasons why intergenerational warfare or <clears throat> conflict is not that pronounced. Um, lots of good reasons why it's not and why I'm not that pessimistic about uh, a coming, a coming, uh, you know, big violent uh, change. Well, it's good that someone is, is, uh, is optimistic about that. Uh, so uh, th like this whole, this whole conversation is sort of based on this premise that like generations are like a definable thing that we can say, okay, so here's where the baby boomers end, and then here's where the Gen Xers start, and then here's where the millennials start and end. And like, it's all based on that. Like, do you, obviously your the point of your whole book is based on, on generations. So obviously you have, have at least some sort of belief in that idea. Um, like, but how, how definable a class do you think a generation is? And like, how do you work, go about working out where that divide is between say, the, the tail end of millennials and the start of the zoomers. It starts with that point that, you know, the very, some very big thinkers in sociology and philosophy, like Karl Mannheim in particular, who's a Hungarian sociolo sociologist and but Auguste Comte, a French philosopher and, and lots and lots of other people, mostly at the turn of the 20th century around the effects of the first world war. Um, there was a lot of thinking about how the generations get formed. A lot of the thinking comes from that. And it is a bit, it's about the fact that <clears throat> at that point about in our formative years, what's going on tends to shape us more than at other points. So if there's big things happening um, during that point, then um, that will make a distinctive identity for that generation. So the pandemic is you know, the one that we're looking to now and see what that does. But then Mannheim also <clears throat> talked about the fact that we're kind of pulled apart by slower evolutionary change in any case. And you can get um, groups forming um, around group identities forming around that type of uh, just gradual change. We grow up in different technological or economic circumstances and that can kind of uh, uh, do that. Um, but my view, I, and then but obviously they, and they were talking about generations as 15, 20 year groups, and it was kind of similar to how we do now. So it's formed a lot of this type of thinking. <clears throat> but the point about, you know, are these really hard categories that you can uh, put a clear definition around in the way that you can with some, some other um, demographics? And the, and the answer is no, there's judgment within that. There's some are very uh, relatively clear based around the demography, like baby boomers. Um, you know, that was a, a baby boom or a couple of baby booms, really in the UK. Uh, but then when you get to Gen X, Millennials, um, Gen Z, it is much more about the judgment of what does this uh, this cohort look like compared to, to that cohort. I guess the thing that I would say is <clears throat> all of those, nearly all social, social classifications of those types, of, of any type, have that element to them of judgment. Social class, income, where you put the cuts in income bands or social classes, um, how you think about ethnicity is much more complex than it can be reduced into the simple categories that 
that we use or, or race. Uh, so all of them have simplifications. And the real test for me is, does it tell you anything useful about society? And what I think in the book is that it does. You can see clear differences between these cohorts, very, very different experiences, behaviors, attitudes, values uh, between these different groups and some that are different and stay different. You know, you think of, you can see very different attitudes and relationships with the religion, um, you know, big things like uh, how, how religion is important, declining generation on generation, but then even smaller activities like our relationship with alcohol, <clears throat> hugely generational, um, where pre-war generation, you know, a third of them drink alcohol five times or more a week. Um, and it's virtually non-existent as a behavior in Gen Z. Um, very, very low, and it kind of goes down each generation. So all the, it's about whether is it useful um, to understand society. And then the boundaries are, um, I think you just have to be pragmatic about the boundaries, that the people that are closer to the boundaries are obviously going to be more like uh, people on just the other side of the boundary. Um, but that's the same with social class, same with lots, of, same with income division, same with lots and lots of different ways that we look at society. So I don't think it, as long as you've got that in mind, well, as long as you, you start from the point of view that generations are a useful measure, but they're not entirely determinant of people. Um, because some of the bad analysis is, is more like a horoscope than, uh, about, than any serious, um, social, social analysis. If you start from the point of view that this is about trying to truly understand what's different and then you're pragmatic about actually, obviously. Uh, this is an indication and people around the boundaries are going to be uh, more similar to each other. And I think you still get lots of value from generations as a, as a concept. Hmm. So uh, one of the things that I've kind of discussed vaguely with, with some people is the idea that technology has accelerated the change between sort of older and, and younger generations that as say previously like cultural touchstones would have lasted for 10 15 20 years that tech is basically moving so fast that those who are five years who are born five years later are no longer or no longer have yet those those same cultural touchstones like for example things have gone just in the 10 years since i was in school from uh through we were I, I remember the facebook thing then then came twitter came instagram came vine yeah. came um i can't even remember there's definitely a few more in there and then tiktok is the latest one basically and it evolved from music dot ly or music cully or basically the things that that define or culturally at least are moving a lot faster and that <laughs> combined with the kind of seeming I don't know, acceleration of madness that we seem to be going through at the minute with the world uh, feels like it might be changing how quickly the generations are, are sort of evolving. Do you think that that it's changing what can be defined as a generation? And do you think that it's accelerating and sort of increasing the differences between each next one? Yeah, that's, again, really good point. And it's, um, it does, it relates to like a big discussion that Carl Mannheim and others had about generations back in the early 20th century, where they, they were, you know, feeling that they were going through a great acceleration themselves. And they talked quite a lot about what does this mean for generational formation, because we've got this, this faster. <clears throat> and Mannheim, you know, basically concluded what you had there is that the faster technology changes um the more uh, the, the quicker that generations will be formed and um the shorter the gaps between these generations he was talking about technology <clears throat> not in the way that we were but he was talking about it in in terms of industrialization um and it was kind of uh, you know big economic things about moving to cities and working in industry and and those types of things where you can see very strongly why <clears throat> it would have big generational formation impacts because the kind of the old skills um, that the older generation kind of were passing down to younger, which was a key bit of generational connection, 
were no longer relevant and young people could actually just ignore <clears throat> ignore older people. And I kind of, I wrote a chapter on this in the book and on technology and it's, the, the, what I concluded was um, that actually technology is really important to us now, um, but the platform that you're on and the emergence of TikTok versus other things is not going to be as determinant as these big economic changes and big social changes. And it's kind of, cause you can see it through throughout history of, well, recent history of generation naming that um, every new innovation, it's a kind of moral panic um, that you see with every new innovation that this is going to change the younger generation utterly to make them utterly different from um, previous generations and in use almost always for the worse rather than for the better. So you've got lots of headlines in history about how uh, dime novels were creating a generation of, um, of sociopaths in, in the U S um, because of their violent content. And then obviously had similar sort of thing about um, video games in, uh, in the U S and UK when they came through and then, and then that kind of feeds through into naming of generations. So there's, there's a lot, when you look at all the sort of failed attempts at naming generations, there are a lot of them that are technology driven. So Nintendo, the Nintendo generation was one that was talked about uh, for a while. And it's kind of, the point is, I suppose that yes, speed is accelerating, but it, these individual platforms and things that we use are, are still small in our lives. And we will look back on the TikTok, the idea that there's going to be a TikTok generation with the same <clears throat> sort of, uh, you know, well, that was foolish um, uh, as we do on why, why on earth would there be a Nintendo generation that's meaningful when you've got all these massive forces of a changing economy, <clears throat> changing home ownership, uh, changing politics and, um, and uh, culture more broadly. Um, pandemics and pandemics and wars and all of those other things. So that was the kind of, that's where I ended up is yes, absolutely pace of change is really important. Technology is a, an important part of that, but individual platforms and what you're actually doing on these types of things is not determining a life course for generations. Mm. Now you, you mentioned there that there, there's some sort of, there are major differences between generations. Um, some of which are quite quite obvious. And um, I actually, if anyone hasn't um, heard of you or your book, um, on the website for it, there's a great quiz that kind of lays out some of the the differences oh, well, yeah, in good. or the, the myths <laughs> about differences between generations, which I pitifully scored on <laughs> four out of ten. Um, so my yes, so my, um, yeah, my assessment isn't isn't ideal. But um, one of the ones that that stood out to me that you kind of list on the on the site was. Um, the mm. this this generation gap on religion which actually seems to be less prevalent yeah. in america than it does here now that could be um something like as we were talking earlier that we're just a little bit behind in terms of that but i have heard a lot of yeah. people and i mean a lot discussing how what this is doing to a society um and having looked at these these differences i wondered if you thought it had the, the yeah the, the seeming like yeah. quite rapid loss of of um people defining themselves as religious at least within the uk um has an effect on a society or just said generation <clears throat> yeah again it's a really interesting area and um i think i mean like the us uk comparison is very telling and very um, important for why we're different from the US, because like you say, they, they, they've got a big obsession with what they call the, the rise of the nuns or the rise of nuns, which is no religion, <clears throat> um, because it's so important to um, a lot of the uh, social and cultural trends within the US. But when you look at their um, uh, feelings of uh, connection to religion, they are so much higher than ours and, and a lot of things are explained in the difference between the us and uk by that or connected to that um uh, in particular it's like um what we tend to have is a a very an older pre-war generation who've got quite a strong connection to religion and then there's not actually much of a gap from baby boomers gen x millennials you know we have quite a quite a quick move to more secular feeling 
um, society post-war. Whereas the US, it's more the differences in that middle, those middle groups of baby boomers, um, and particularly Gen X and um, millennials, and, and particularly Gen X, so baby boomers and Gen X, which are much more religious of the equivalent generations in in the UK, and that that's connected to all sorts of things around politics and then social attitudes to uh, things like abortion and um, uh, but even uh, homosexuality and. Uh, um, uh, gay marriage and, and those types of things. So there's, there's kind of a very strong contrast and, and there's, it's core to a lot of the differences. I think, like I say, I don't, I, th- we move quite quickly to secular, a more secular view. And, and we've got quite a, um, we've got quite a uh, cultural connection to religion that isn't deeply religious, if you see what I mean, in uh, even for a, for quite a long time, and you know, but the people that look at religion talk about how we had something of a conscript army of people involved in religion, where you sort of had to go to church uh, on a Sunday, and there was a bit of a community aspect to it, but there wasn't very; it was never very religious in the way that some of it is in in the US um, <clears throat> and other countries. Um, so, and what we've moved to is a more professional army of um, people are connected to religion. So the numbers have gone down a lot because cultural Christian, it's particularly Christianity, um, cause we have seen increases in other religions, but that connection, that cultural connection to Christianity is the thing that's really gone rather than the deeply, uh, the deeply, the deeply religious people have kind of stayed, um, connected, um, in this more professionalized, um, force of, uh, uh connected to religion. <clears throat> so you actually see attendance attendance levels actually not changed that as, as nearly as much and um over time and and not nearly as big gaps between generations because you've got that that more um professionalized element much smaller proportion but they're there among the younger um generation so i i think it's a i think it is a really important trend for us but it's not the same as the us in many ways because we've always had a bit more secularity to it and a bit more kind of a cultural Christianity rather than deeply um, religious Christianity, at least since um, uh, in these post-war decades. Uh, but yeah, and I think there's, there's a massive challenge for Christian religions in the UK in particular, though, because it is very stark, the falls between generations in their sense of connection and you can the thing about those types of things and why generations are important is when you see very flat lines of generation you're tracking generations over time and they kind of get socialized into a level of uh, connection to religion and that stays with them throughout their life for that cohort of people it doesn't really it goes up and down for individuals Obviously, but in aggregate, it doesn't really shift. So what that means is you've got a slow but inevitable decline. If each new generation is coming in at a lower level and the current youngest generation is coming in at very low levels of connection to Christianity, then there's not a lot you can do about that. It's really hard to shift when it gets going. Um, so there is a real challenge. And and you, you see that in the Archbishop of Canterbury talking about, you know, the actual, the average Anglican now is uh, a, a, an African, a black African woman living, uh, aged under 25, living in an African country because it, you know, it's doing much better abroad than as a religion than it is doing in the UK. So that's the challenge of, uh, of it. And it's a serious one for um, those. And you, you, you had, it, it's difficult to see how that changes, to be honest now. Hmm. Yeah. Do you think we've replaced it with something else? I said, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I do think we weren't naturally that close to it in any case. So the things that we replace it with are, depends if you mean, I suppose, spiritually or, you know, community-based. And I, I think community-based, those types of elements of it, we have replaced in different sorts of ways through technology and um, other types of connections. Although... I mean, another one of the big themes in the book is we've lost a lot of those community uh, structures in all sorts of ways, much more individualized society. And that individualization is one of the key trends that explains 
partly explains why generations aren't more angry <laughs> about their outcomes, their worse outcomes than they they um, than they whether well, they're not more angry than they uh, could be justified in being. Um, so we have had more individualization of it. Um, I don't I don't see or I haven't seen any particular evidence that there's a different sort of spirituality being replaced. I know that sometimes claimed as a generational trend in the US. And I think it's pretty dodgy um, claiming, um, to be honest, although it is more spiritual in the US, but there isn't the same sort of trend here as far as I can see. Yeah, I mean, I guess that, well, that's the whole premise of um, the series I'm watching, American Gods. I don't know if you know it. It's a great, 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 great book. And I'm quite enjoying the series. Um, but uh, that's not really what we're here to talk about. So um, I, actually, uh, just I was just thinking when you were when you were mentioned there about the, the differences in um, like our levels of, of, of spirituality is that there's. Yeah. Do you think it's just a trope? Because I mean, um, whilst I do sort of lend credence to the to like Nietzsche's God is dead sort of um, idea, it's. Not a new one. Um, it's been around for a while. Um, it, it's, it kind of feels like maybe each generation is like, oh, these young people today. Um, is, is, have you like? Did you find that in your research? Like, people tend to believe that the next generation are just like tearing apart like cultural touchstones and ideas when really there's a lot more stagnation, perhaps than there, the, than people realize. Yeah, again, really good point. I mean, it's um, that is a constant of, of history, is the denigration of young people um, coming through. And it's, um, you know, go back, there's a famous quote attributed to Socrates in 400 BC about how the young people have, um, have lost all their morals and don't respect their elders and all of this. But you can go through the whole of history and there's, you know, there's letters to Town and Country magazine in the 1800s in in the UK calling young people, uh, it's, a, it's a great phrase of um, self-admiring emaciated fribbles or some things, which is, you know, so close to snowflakes mm, today, it's a very similar sort of view of these things. And it's just time and time again, and it is it is a constant because, because of this point of generational <clears throat> renewal. Um, there's a great um, demographer from the 1950s in Canada who talked about um, <clears throat> generational replacement as a type of demographic metabolism um, because we get so set in our ways <clears throat> we need these new generations but what he says is he, each each new generation always feels to the older generation like an invasion of the barbarians um, is his uh, his phrase for it and it's because they're not configured in his sociological terms configured to like current norms and values or the ones that older people uh, hold dear. So it's utterly inevitable and natural, uh, unavoidable, that we've got that sense of this particular generation of young people are the worst ever. Um, and it's just from our own own perspective. And I kind of, I'm, there is no, there is no evidence of um you know that this is in constant decline i mean it isn't it, we're not constantly going downhill there's a really interesting thing that we did with um uh we asked people what adjectives they'd use to describe different generations and we did it um on millennials versus baby boomers a few years ago and all the all the baby boomer um, adjectives were things like community orientated and work orientated and um you know, respectful and all these types of things. And then all the millennial ones were things like lazy, materialistic. And, um, and this was everyone picking this, including millennials, um, like talking about themselves. Uh, but then we did it a couple of years later and we uh, asked about Gen Z millennials and baby boomers. Was, um, yeah, missed out, Gen X. And all of the negative adjectives have been transferred to Gen Z from millennials. And it wasn't, you know, it's just because they were the youngest on the list. It wasn't that millennials had suddenly gone up in everyone's estimation. And millennials got quite positive adjectives attached to them. It wasn't that millennials had suddenly gone up in people's estimations. It's just that actually people uh, are thinking about young people. They're not thinking about the character of these different generations. And they just always give 
the more negative views to whoever happens to be the youngest at the time. Is it possible that the, the millennials are really the best generation and the next, the kids are, I mean, have you spoken to the kids these days? I mean, they're all, you know, bullshy upstarts. And I was definitely never like that. Uh <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the first thing is they're no longer kids. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is the, um, you know, 26 to well into their uh, late 30s now. So it's sort of, um, unfortunately, we're all moving up. So it's, um, uh, yeah, this this sense of, well, two things, I suppose. It, that, that, that sense of millennials still being young, they kind of came, came of age during that social media explosion. So they got an awful lot of the focus and millennials killing everything and, you know, all those kind of memes memes and stuff were all focused on millennials. Um, so we've got this sort of Im- image of them as part of that sort of uh, coming generation and it's, it kind of sticks um sticks with them uh, uh a bit um but i mean yeah equally on the sort of um you know the are they a coming generation of saviors that was actually you know there was a few books in the us that were that were predicting that they'd be a particularly civic generation and very involved in in things and i think the reality is the differences are not that big in terms of involvement. Um, when I look at things like social purpose activity of, of um, boycotting things or, um, you know, uh, being active <clears throat> activists on stuff, it's actually the older generations who do that more, uh, baby boomers and Gen X in particular. Um, and that's more a feature of age than it is of generation. We tend to grow into those types of behaviors over time rather than starting off uh, doing lots of that things, mainly, you know, partly because we can't afford it. I can't afford it. You've got a lot of pressing things when you're young and you haven't got much money um, to, to sort out. Um, so I, I don't think there is a particular sign. It was a common claim, particularly in America, that millennials will come and save us. Um, and Barack Obama still does quite, did quite a lot of that about coming generation, then has transferred it to Gen Z. I do think that's a worry. Um, I think it's a worry because I, I talk about climate change in the book and how we've got this misperception of older people don't care about climate change. And it's built a little bit on this lionizing of young people coming through and they're going to save us or they're, you know, they're the ones pushing for change. But, but it's, when you look at the evidence, there's not much gap between young and old in climate concern or climate behavior in lots of ways. And so I think not only are we putting an awful lot on coming generations, we're also dismissing vast swathes of the population of older people who are a growing demographic um, because of aging societies and also richer. Uh, they're, the bit, they're the people with all the money. Um, so it's not very smart to uh, position it as older people don't care. Really, you want to bring people into that, um, not dividers, according to fake differences. So we need to, we need to, we need to be careful of lionizing the young or hoping that they're going to sort everything out uh, because it's not true but also because it's counterproductive mm. now that you you've actually uh, brought us very nicely onto one of the, the the last questions i want to ask you um so you mentioned that there's a lot of books in um, america specific um for example that have talked about this idea that the, the millennials are coming to save us and um i'm assuming that one of these books is the the fourth turning um, so yeah, the laying out like Strauss high intergenerational theory, um, and it basically to me um, seems to be like a code like a codification of that that sort of that old trope um, that Lawrence Fox got in a lot of trouble for tweeting uh, recently uh, that um, strong men make good times, good times make weak men, weak men make bad times, bad times make strong men. So along those lines, I mean, I also think we have to replace the word men in that with people, but um, for, you know, the modern context, but like, I think that the, I at least think that the, that credence, that sort of idea has some sort of credence. Um, I don't think it's, it's that wrong. I mean, I, I don't think that like it's an exact in, ineffable science, but the fourth turn and at least it seems to have some sort of uh some sort of validity to me in terms of how 
um, societies and institutions sort of degrade over time and then renew themselves through um, as a result of crisis. And obviously the, the, the authors of The Fourth Turning have picked, I think, 2025 it was as this like oncoming collapse or crisis or however you want to define it like how much credence do you give to that theory and and yeah do do you buy it essentially uh, yeah i mean i i really like the book and the and the well all the the generation the first one on generation and then fourth turning was um really it's a the really interesting um books but i don't think they're right <laughs> in um and i think you know loads of interesting ideas in there but w- really quite widely criticized as a telling of history that it's historical um reference and what it what it puts it what they put in and what they ignore that don't fit this cycle um is quite important i think and and i think um uh it, i i don't particularly like that generations as astrology type view where you're kind of set on a path because it is, you know, that the fourth turning was Steve Bannon's, one of Steve Bannon's favorite books. And he wrote, he did a documentary on it called Generation Zero, mostly about the financial crisis, but, um, but then bringing in this idea that we're moving towards inevitable crisis. Um, I think that's really risky because if you think it's inevitable, then you're not going to do anything about trying to avert it or um, uh, or take any kind of action. And it sort of like it's almost embracing this cycle of um, crisis. And then, I mean, on the specifics of it, I think, you know, it did seem to shift quite a lot when Strauss and Howe were predicting this. It was anything from the 2010s all the way up to um, the 2020s, I think, was um, when you look at their things. So they give themselves quite a wide um, margin. And then I think finally, from my perspective, I, I mean, it sort of shows the um, the foolishness or the, you know, foolhardiness of that type of prediction when we have a pandemic like we've had, um, because, you know, we may well end up with a crisis like that, uh, but it will be the result of a, of a virus that started in the Wuhan district in China. And that is nothing to do with the particular configuration of generations that we have right now. So it's it's kind of it almost illustrates. Um, and I, I'm also you know so you, you could count the pandemic as a black swan event, um, as uh, Taleb would call it, and that these unpredictable things happen, and they're the ones that you really that really matter. Um, and I also kind of think that's true, but it's also really important to know what's happening the slower changes that are happening between generations because the context it lands in is really important too when you have these types of events. It doesn't dismiss the history, you know, the slower moving history and not not saying everything is down to events. Um, But I do think that is overreaching in terms of this 80 80 year cycle of catastrophe that that is due to the particular repeated character of um, four generational types, and when you get the right configuration or the wrong configuration of those generation types, then you end in crisis. I don't, I don't think that's true. There's much more complexity and nuance to generations than can be summed up in that. And, and I pick some of the some of the claims in in uh, the fourth turning and other Strauss and Howe books to show how some of the things they asserted about the character of millennials, for example, they've just been proven to be wrong. Um, you know, you, well, there's no way that you could say that they are true. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I would I would question that partly because it doesn't seem to fit, but most mostly I think in the end because it gives you a sense that we've got no agency and we can't change anything. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely, it's, it reminds me of the, was it Har- Harold Macmillan quote, like events, my dear boy, you know, you might made a, I made this nice model and then the pandemic comes along. And, um, we have, yeah, yet to see what, what sort of effect that has on the, the generation that's, that's grown up with that. Um, but it's, I guess it's quite nice to be able to think about, you know, oh, okay, it's all right. We're just in this big cycle and there's lots of rules and that's all going to sort itself out. You know, that'll, 
you know, we'll, we'll degrade and then we'll renew and then we'll degrade. Yeah. And like you said, it kind of takes away the agency. It like makes us not want to renew the institutions ourselves. We're just like, oh, well, you know, history will take care of it, <laughs> which is, yeah, quite um, almost a pessimistic uh, way to look at it. So, yeah, the, the final thing I wanted to, 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 to ask you about, if you've got, yeah, a few minutes is uh, essentially that in you've you've mentioned um, on your site and, and in this interview and in the book that you don't believe that we're heading towards some sort of mass intergenerational clash, essentially, that there's a lot of people talking about how, for example, in America, we're, they're facing some sort of cultural civil war or whatever, and they there's a lot of the similar um, sort of divisions within British society, albeit sort of slightly different that people seem to think we're heading for this clash between um what uh david goodhart actually to go back to him describes as the the somewheres and the anywheres that 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 that, that generational gap is is going to cause for example the the millennials and the zoomers to rise up against the baby boomers who are hoarding all the wealth or something along those lines so you know we're going to get pissed about climate change or something like that why do you think that that's not the case because i don't know from at least my perspective it looks like there are quite severe differences um with some of which have been debunked actually by your website that was an interesting one um but uh it still seems like there's a serious division and things are kind of amping up um that that that, that things continue to get crazier and that just makes everyone else crazier and it's like this horrendous feedback loop of madness and it feels it just i don't know from my perspective it feels like we're approaching some sort of head of of craziness and that something has to give so like why do you not think that's the case yeah i mean i'm yes i suppose the uh the thing that i'm most worried about in the book is more generational separation than conflict outright conflict or crisis or war between the generations because we, we are we're living more separately in physical spaces than we ever have done in the uk and the us between age groups so you've had this sorting into cities of young people and um, uh, more uh, suburban and rural areas for um, older people we've also got that digital separation where we have got um you know, we, older people may be more likely to be online now, but they're doing different things and they're in different spaces to younger people. So there's still really significant separation between them. And then we've got that type of political separation that we've seen emerge as well of different, uh, very strong age gradients in party support. So I think the real issue is that separation, because with that separation comes that sense of division and stereotyping of the other side and all those all those other things that make it feel like we're very close to crisis i guess because it gets the when you're in two separate camps you kind of uh, end up denigrating the other side or not understanding the other side and that leads to <coughs> misunderstand you know misunderstandings and then negative views of uh, each other so i think that is a real risk i'm not downplaying the importance of that separation and stereotyping and uh, caricaturing that leads to um, more fractious relationships between them. I think the, 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 um, there's actually three or four reasons that, you know, touched on a bit is uh, that we don't see it coming is that we, first of all, love our parents, grandparents, and don't want them. It, it, inevitably, those sorts of strong relationships up and down the things color our views of what we want to do generally and there's a love element to that the second one is there's also a um more selfish element to that which is <clears throat> if we get resources or money taken away from older people it's going to fall on us at some point as <laughs> looking after uh, older people the third one is is that view of we're all we're much more connected by age than by other characteristics because we all age it's different for us and you know people like the late great john hills talked about the welfare system is a lifetime redistribution system from, you know, at various points from to children, towards children and towards old people, from people earning in the middle. And it's kind of, we've got a kind of sense of that 
ourselves that we we need to be looked after we will need to be looked after later as well so we've got that sort of sense and the final one is we've got real there's a really strong natural uh sense of the importance of contribution um to us that people who've contributed should get support or get things back and it's really really good so we did some focus groups on this years ago for with the think tank on generational differences and <clears throat> it was so striking that um we got that sense of fairness that is a lot to do with have you paid in have you done your dues paid your dues and done your sort of stuff and by dint of being old older people have contributed more um you know we also got this sense that they've lived through harder times and uh, built a lot of stuff for us. It's got very strong sense that those who, that contribution should be reflected in how people are treated. So you've always got that dynamic of you will always have that care for older people because you've got a general sense. It's not just you know your own parents. It's a general sense. God, they put a lot in. We should be helping them now. Um, so all of those things kind of dampen that sense of. Um, uh, conflict between those different groups, and I think that, I think they act as a really strong buffer on generational wars that you would actually see generational, proper generational conflict. Well, um, Bobby, it's been uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, if you do, you want to tell people where they can find um, you and your book? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm. We've got a little website. I think it's just called. You just type generations.org, uh, generationsbook.org. You should be able to find the website for it, and um, it's got lots of uh, actual examples from the book, quiz, and then where to get the book, which is yeah, you can get the book anywhere, hopefully, um, in most bookshops. But uh, yeah, yeah, do do have a look at the website, uh, and do try to pick up the book if you can. Fantastic. Well, um, I will put links in the description for anyone who wants to check those out um, for the book and for the quiz and everything. It's definitely interesting. So I recommend anyone that's got a couple of minutes, go check it out. But um, yeah, thanks so much for your time. No worries. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the podcast. Don't forget our sponsor, ExpressVPN, and my book, Brexit, The Establishment Civil War, can both be found in the links in the description below. And also, please like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. It's the best way to help us grow. Until next time, thanks for listening. The animal dragged a child around its enclosure. The child had fallen into that enclosure. Officials are now defending their actions. ABC's Alex. A few things I am not. I'm not a cat. I am not an institutional investor, nor am I a hedge fund. There's no panic selling. These people, you know, they may have bought at $4, sat through $400, went back to 40, went to 350, back down to 110, and they have not sold. All they've done is bought more. And there's no answer for that. There's no, they, they, you know, it, it is like art of war mastery by a bunch of idiots who should know better. And they're just, they're just like, I'm not fucking leaving! Fly me to the moon Let me play among the stars Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars What's been happening on Reddit and in social media and in the marketplace has never been seen before. Uh, the short 70, 60, 80% of a company, let alone 140%, I think a lot of people universally believe something is wrong there. They're powerful, they want to stock hire. It's child's play. Why ever sell into the maw of Wall Street, you know, Reddit bets? Why, why, why? But everyone's wrong. It's like the big short again, or more like the big short squeeze this time, right? So here we got the fox guarding the hen house, and one of the hens is complaining, the fox is out to kill us. And the farmer says, I'm sorry, the fox is in charge of the hen house. Whenever there is not billions, but like trillions of dollars involved in something, it, I, I argue that nothing is off the table. The way they have absolutely cheated, stolen, robbed everyday people, so all our hedge fund billionaire friends can get out and not get killed it is one of the most remarkable, illegal, shocking robberies 
in the history of in plain sight. Super Stonk and the other communities that have emerged are a hive mind, the likes of which we have never seen before. It's madness and brilliance, insanity and genius all rolled into one. It's very possible that Citadel will be gone in a few months. And, and not just Citadel, but the entire financial system has the potential to come crashing down. These crooks continue to gamble recklessly with the world economy and this could be the moment that they finally get their justice. You've got maybe 10 million people doing this who now own, you know, probably more than 100 million shares and eventually, you know, they might own everything. 